violence in Israel, terrorism in the Middle East, and the United States-Israel relationship. The things which are implied by all of that have been uh, troubling to us, extraordinarily important, as you know, and very difficult to, to manage. And today, uh, the implications are much more important to us, it seems, and much more urgent. So we're absolutely delighted uh, to have the acting ambassador with us this evening to discuss these matters. Uh, Minister Barack uh, was born in Montevideo, emigrated to Israel in 1969, uh, received his Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and history from Tel Aviv University, his Master of Arts degree in political science from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, joined the Foreign Service in 1977. He's been posted variously, but in Lima, as to the European community in Brussels, served as deputy chief of mission uh, in Belgium and Luxembourg. And uh, after the Oslo Accords in 1993, was the chief coordinator of the negotiations with the Palestinians until 1966. He later served as 19, yeah, well, some of us live in the past. I was, <laughs> I just went back to my, my 50th high school reunion, you see. <laughs> and uh, you're great, grateful if you could live anywhere after. <laughs> but until 1996. And following that was uh, Deputy Director General at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and in August of 2000 was appointed as Deputy Chief of Mission uh, to the Israeli Embassy in Washington. We're absolutely delighted to have what is really the authoritative voice of Israel in the United States, the Acting Ambassador, uh, Raphael Barak, uh, with us this evening. Well, uh, thank you, Frank, for this uh, warm introduction, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Let me start by the Q&A, or maybe by the Q. Everybody is asking me if I'm related to Ehud Barak, our former prime minister. <laughs> so in order that everybody will be calm and quiet, listen to what I have to say, let me answer first to this question. I'm not related with uh, Ehud Barak. Barak is a very common name in Israel. It, it means lightning in Hebrew. And uh, I uh, used to say that we have a barack in each uh, ministry in Israel, so I'm the one of the foreign ministry. <laughs> so thank you, for, uh, the Baltimore Council of Foreign Affairs, for providing the opportunity to speak with you tonight. It is a pleasure to join you to discuss the current situation in Israel, regional threats, and the invaluable nature of the U.S.-Israel relationship when forging the path towards peace. Before I begin, I wish to provide some historical analysis about events in the region. In Israel's mere 54 years, we have been forced to build the country with one hand, while the other held tightly onto the sword. This has not been our choice from the beginning, and it is not our choice today. If there is one message that I wish to impart to you is that Israel is, and always has been, a peace-seeking country. The current reality is not one that we have chosen. It's one that is, has, we have been forced, just as war and terror have been imposed upon Israel since even before its founding in 1948. And let me explain a little bit. Since its establishment, the history of Israel can be divided in, fear, in four uh, big phases. The first is initial in 1948, the phase of fighting for independence. The next, from uh, 67 and on to 73, is that of the military reliance. The third, from 73 to 2000, is an, an attempt to achieve peace through negotiations. On the fourth, is the one that we are currently in, that of an abated Palestinian terror and a subsequent freeze of political talks. Let me begin with the first phase. 
Israel was born out of war. In 1947, the United Nations proposed the partition plan, that is the UN Resolution 181, to create an Arab and a Jewish state in the British Mandate of Palestine. Though the Jews agreed to the partition, the Arab countries refused. And not only they refused, but they chose war. Within hours of our independence, on May 15, 1948, Israel was attacked by five Arab countries. For one and a half years, Israel struggled and it lost 1% of its total population, that is 6,000 people. The equivalent is nearly 3,100 fatalities in the United States today. During the first phase of Israel history, from 1948 to 1967 and the Six Days War, Israel fought for its survival and international legitimacy, with a strong emphasis upon military might. We were forced to build the infrastructure country while concentrating most heavily upon building our system of defense. Just to give you a clear idea, Israel is approximately of the size of the state of New Jersey. After the independence, we were almost uh, 600,000 600, Jews in, in the state. In the first two years or three years, we assimilate and absorb over one and a half million of immigrants coming from Europe and Arab countries. Establishing the only democracy in the Middle East create a vibrant culture and a thriving economy. This despite the fact that we have been natural, that we have few natural resources. And as the Bible says, Israel is certainly the land of milk and honey. But as Golda Meir once said, Moses wandered the desert to give the Jews the only land in the Middle East without oil. As Israel attempts to build his infrastructure and absorb new immigrants and develop his economy, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan prepared for another war. And in 1967, Egypt expelled the UN forces that were in the Sinai Peninsula, while Jordan closed the Strait of Tehran. Well, sorry, well, Egypt closed the Strait of Tehran, both with set the stage that they would become uh, as the Six Days War. In June 1967, we beat back several Arab nations and expanded our territory almost 500,000 square miles, which include the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights from Syria, and the West Bank from Jordan at that time. Following the Six Days War, the UN passed a resolution, a very important resolution, his number is 242. Since then, the Arabs and the international community refer it to so often, it is important to me to look at the 242 a little bit closer. 242 is not a call for Israel to withdraw from all the territories occupied after 1967. The language of the resolution calls for, a, and I'm quoting, a withdrawal of Israel armed forces from territories occupied in the re recent conflicts. Just to clarify, 242 does not specify which territories or the conditions on which Israel should withdraw. 242 also calls for all the states in the region to work for peace, not just Israel. Thus, nowhere in the resolution does it state that the Palestinians are entitled to all the territories won by the Israelis in the Six Days, days War. It's uh, uh, what we call the Land for Peace Resolution. I will come uh, later a little bit uh, speaking about this issue. Israel's victory uh, ushered uh, in the second period in Israel's history an age of military reliance and readiness last, lasted from 1967 till 1973, it's the second period. We felt at that time uh, that we have gained some legitimacy and control in the region. Our victory has reaffirmed our confidence and sense in our military strength. At the same time, however, we knew we could not take our survival for granted which allows us to rely heavenly in our military might. Since the Arab nations have attempted to destroy Israel and failed, 
we wait for them to make an overture of peace and reconciliation while maintaining a strong defense. We offered to come to, to a peace dialogue, but they didn't come. In general, those were good years for Israel, for the Israeli inhabitants, for the Israeli economy, that led to a lot of agricultural developments. There were a lot of new uh, enterprises created, textile, food scrap. Israel evolved from an agricultural society to an industrial society. And uh, uh, our research, uh, our university flourished during these this, uh, years. After 1973, when the first, uh, third period started and uh, the Yom Kippur War uh, started against us when Egypt and Syria launched a combined attack, Israel learned that peace could, could not be reached through force or military might. Despite our victory, we came to understand that a military answer to the Arab-Israeli conflict will never bring peace to our, our Arab neighbors. It became clear that negotiation and diplomacy was the only path that would lead to a sustainable peace. And we were very glad that our neighbors also believed that. Thus, we initiated a peace movement, uh, the third phase of the Israeli history, that began with disengagement agreements. At that time, we withdrew from Sinai, and we withdrew from the Golan Heights, and uh, the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, was very instrumental in 1974 and 1975 to implement those agreements. The culmination of this uh, uh, start of ne starting of negotiations were in 1977, when in November, uh, President Sadat uh, arrived to Jerusalem for the first time. And I remember till today, I was a junior cadet at the ministry. They sent me to the airport, and I saw uh, uh, my prime minister at that time, uh, uh, Menachem Begin, and uh, the former prime minister, Golda Meir, you know, pinching his hand, he said, it's not true, it's not true, it's not true. <laughs> but it was true, and we saw uh, President Sadat coming down to the ladders to, from his uh, plane and uh, changing the dynamics of, the, of our relationship. And finally, signing uh, um, in Camp David, the first Camp David in 1979, the peace uh, treaty with Israel. In this peace treaty, Israel withdrew from the entire Sinai Peninsula, as I said, about 50,000 50, square miles, in exchange for an understanding of peace with Egypt, a country that had been our enemy for over 30 years. Despite the historic nature of this peace gesture, the only Arab country to support the Camp David Accords were Oman. The other Arab countries stand still. The next window of opportunity for negotiations came after the Gulf War, following 39 Iraqi SCAT missiles that attacked Israel in 1991. It was at this time that also the Soviet Union collapsed, and there was a new window of opportunity in this world. And uh, you may remember the Madrid conference that convened all the parties in the area, initiated by, the, at that time, the Secretary of State, uh, James Baker, and uh, that ushered the afterwards in the Oslo peace process that started in 1993, where Palestinians and Israelis had uh, secret negotiations and come into an agreement in principles about the ways to come to a peace a treaty with the Palestinians in a few years. At the very foundation of these diplomatic efforts was understanding that terror could never bring two Palestinians closer to a state. This was a process that continues for many years. And since the creation of the State of Israel, and, despite, and we, were, we have the wars that I, I told you a little bit, but there was terror. Almost this came through our history, hand by hand, day by day, almost during different periods. So, uh, for us, it was very important that uh, signing an accord, an agreement with the Palestinians, they uh, completely abandoned the use of Stero as a negotiation tool. And this was the main condition that uh, our late Prime Minister, Itzhak Rabin, put to open a discussion and the, the peace discussions with the, the Palestinians and to came to Washington at that time, as you may remember, uh, to sign this agreement. On September 9, 1993, Chairman Yasser Arafat formally renounced to use of violence as a means of attaining his political goals 
and he wrote a letter to the Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, understanding that this is, those are the new rules. Only dialogue, we, are to, we have to dialogue around the table of negotiations, no more war, uh, no more worship. This understanding served to define the third phase of Israeli history, that of negotiating land for peace in hopes of creating a secure and stable Middle East. Keep in mind that when we say land for peace, that involves Israel's offer for something very tangible and concrete, for something easily reversed, such as trust. At the time, we were under the impression that our trust was reciprocated. Thus, we were ready to willing to proceed, giving land and receiving peace. This understanding ushered in a new era where seemingly war had ended and we were approaching the onset of a lasting peace, an era of economic cooperation between Arabs and Israelis, an era where we met together many times in different places, in Casablanca, in Doha, in Cairo, in, uh, in, in Amman, uh, in huge uh, economic uh, gatherings where Israelis and uh, Arabs and uh, business from all over the world try to promote uh, a new kind of relationships. Relationship flourish and Israel becomes ready and willing to make painful compromise for a future of peace. Um, the negotiations uh, uh, went on, and this open atmosphere led uh, to the Israeli and Jordanian peace agreement in 1994, and encouraged moderate Arab regimes to initiate diplomatic ties with Israel. At that time, we had op uh, Israeli office, uh, we call it a trade office in Qatar, in Morocco, in Tunisia, uh, and uh, also in uh, uh, Qatar. These uh, negotiations uh, culminate also with a, a very honest try to come to an agreement with Syria that fell. And uh, at the Camp David summit with the Palestinians in July 2000, when former Prime Minister Ehud Barak offered the Palestinians the, for, the more far-reaching proposals in Israeli history, consistently at the very end of nearly 97% of our territories uh, of, of Gaza and, and the West Bank, and uh, having in, uh, in, in exchange a peace agreement. Arafat's refusal to negotiate and to offer a counter offer at that time, and the 20 months of violence that, that have uh, ensued marked the beginning of the fourth stage of Israel history with its neighbors, that of a sustained and systematic campaign of Palestinian terror. For the Palestinians have clearly made the decision to abandon the promise at Oslo, to adopt a strategy of terror and use violence as means of achieving what they refuse to attain by peaceful means. Thus, after the failure of Camp David, we began to realize that the Oslo process did not have a strong enough foundation to sustain our hopes and dreams. It crumbled and failed for two specific reasons. First, there was, there was no system of accountability. The Palestinians were never held accountable for failing to implement the basic terms they have pledged to abide, such as the terms outlined in the letter that Arafat wrote to Itzhak Rabin in September 93. The second reason for its failure was the fact that neighboring urban countries failed to offer the support for reaching a negotiated deal. Unfortunately, as Oslo began to crumble, the line between partner and adversary began to blur. In the past 20 months, it has become abundantly clear that the Palestinian Authority has encouraged, financed, promote, instigate, and even facilitate the continuation of terrorist attacks against Israel that have taken well over 500 innocent Israeli lives and, and created a situation of dismay for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Which brings us to modern day and strategic threats facing Israel as it endures the new reality of terror and war. 
Like the United States, Israel is faced with the elusive threat of organized terror and the growing danger of incitement and hate. Make no mistake, these developments have replaced conventional war as the most serious threat to our future. At the same time, the majority of Israelis still support the creation of a Palestinian state, but they have come to realize that we cannot reward those who seek our destruction. Before we can proceed with negotiations, the Palestinian leadership must understand that terror must be uprooted, incitement and violence ended, because terror and negotiations cannot coexist. Peace can only grow in an atmosphere conducive to security, stability, and strength. At the present, the PA is lacking all the three. Most importantly, Yasser Arafat is lacking the foresight and leadership to guide the Palestinian people into a future of prosperity and peace. This is precisely why Prime Minister Sharon has stated that Israel would not negotiate with the PA, the Palestinian Authority, until it proves to be a genuine partner whom we are able to speak. The following step must be taken before political negotiations can resume. First and foremost, before anything else, we must reestablish security to Israel. We must secure our citizens, borders, and cities from harm. We will not turn a blind eye as attacks continue or sit idly by a sterile gross in our midst. We expect the Palestinians to assist our struggle for security and peace. Since 93 to 2000, we gave to them the credit to keep our security. We knew that there were terrorist organizations uh, acting in, in the Palestinian Authority, but they said we'll take responsibility. Since September 2000, this disappeared. So now it's also their responsibility to join efforts with us in order to keep the security of Israel. Uh, and this is the first and basic condition of my government. Second, there must be a considerable reform in the Palestinian Authority itself. There must be a chief executive that will lead a provisional government and a clear balance of power created between various governing institutions such as security or defense, economics, justice, education, mass media. And most importantly, the new government must be free from corruption, abiding the rule of law, on promoting an atmosphere conducive to peace. This reform is vital to the plight of the Palestinian people who have faced economic and social devastation as a result of the Palestinian Authority utter failure to lead. Mark my words, only once the PA begins to undergo successful and systemic reform can we ever hope to begin negotiations that will lead to a durable and lasting peace. Unfortunately, the threats uh, facing Israel extend beyond to our uh, backyard. While the Palestinian Authority has made the strategic decision to facilitate a campaign of terror against Israel, other countries in the region have aided their efforts. Perhaps the most recent illustra illustration of this was the recent attempt of the Palestinian leadership to smuggle over 50 tons of Iranian arms, weapons, and explosives via the, via the Red Sea. Additionally, funding for suicide bombers has been directly linked to Iraq. They are offering $25,000 to each family of uh, suicide bombers. And Saudi Arabia funding Hamas and other terrorist organizations. Both countries, Saudi Arabia and Iraq, are known for the, the, these extensive contributions while Iran and Syria continue to support Hezbollah in our northern forum. This is also important because uh, in, uh, uh, two years ago, uh, we withdraw from Lebanon. We come to a conclusion that uh, we, we have to adopt the 4 to 5 Security Council resolution. And this uh, implies uh, that Israel will withdraw from Lebanon and implies also that the Lebanese has to deploy their forces in, this, in the southern border. Uh, till, till now, the Lebanese didn't deploy, and we have a terrorist organization threatening Israel, and this is an, an important, a very important issue. 
Uh, we know that today there are more than 9,000 rockets uh, in this area of South Lebanon, the Beka Valley, under the control of uh, revolutionary guards coming from Iran, cooperating with Hezbollah. And we know that, that these rockets can, can, can reach uh, uh, our, not only Haifa, but also Hedera. If, if you, those of you do remember the um, geography of my country, that is reaching almost uh, more than a million of our citizens. So this threat is uh, it's a very serious threat and uh, it's a very disappointing one after Israel, Israel thought that he's accomplishing the UN resolutions and going to the uh, uh, through what it implies in the resolution, but uh, uh, this was not the way that uh, our neighbors uh, uh, understood this resolution. Um, another aspect that is important in our region to remember is the, the responsibility of Syria uh, harboring terrorist networks uh, responsible for the last uh, wave of attacks in Israel. In fact, uh, Damascus serves as a headquarters for 11 terrorist organizations, one of which, the Islamic Jihad, uh, ordered uh, two weeks ago when a car uh, blasted himself and close to a bus, Israeli bus, and 19 Israelis were killed in Megiddo, uh, in, um, uh, south of Haifa. Uh, this, uh, the order was given by the, uh, the leader of the Islamic Jihad in Damascus. And this is despite the fact that Syria is currently serving as president of the United Nations Security Council. If it was so serious, it would almost be a joke. While the path forward is difficult to navigate, one thing is perfectly clear. The essential counterbalance of these threats are the ongoing efforts of the United States to bring stability to the region. Just as the United States has stood by Israel, Israel joins together with America to ensure the future of security stability, sanctity, justice, and peace in the region. This message underscored Prime Minister Sharon's last visit a week ago in, uh, to Washington. This visit was a successful one, primarily because President Bush and Prime Minister Sharon agreed the diplomatic efforts to restore stability must be accompanied by a reform on the Palestinian infrastructure itself, as I detailed before. Also agreed upon was the fact that the parties must be well prepared for a future regional conference. Israel's rights to self-defense and the initial implementation of reform in the PA as a prerequisite for political talks. As a supporter of peace, Israel will not sit back as terrorism grows. We will defend ourselves, we will defend freedom, we will defend the future, and in the end, alongside with America, we will prevail because we are believers in the promise of peace. Thank you for the time and your generous consideration. Thank you very much for that background. Uh, it will be helpful. Uh, the floor is open for questions. How, how important are the Palestinians uh, within Israel and from the West Bank to your economy? Well, uh, since uh, September 2000, there are almost no Palestinians coming to Israel. Um, but uh, we have an open border. So everybody can, at least in, from the area of Judea and Samaria, there is, there is no problem. If you want, you, you are a suicide bomber, you can even walk and, uh, and come to our cities. Before that, uh, we have, uh, that since uh, 93 to, and before that also since 97, uh, till uh, 2000, we had almost uh, 150,000 Palestinians working in our uh, industries and uh, agriculture farms. And this uh, was very important. Uh, we, we, all, we, we are always surprised why, in the, why our father declared this, uh, this war in, uh, in September 2000, why, why he decided to use the violence. If we, if we analyze the economic situation of the Palestinians in the last uh, three or two years before uh, 2000, 98, 1999, 2000, so they, they, they were flourishing. They, they, were, they were growing 6% uh, a year. And they were almost everybody has a job. And, uh, and we weren't discussing, uh, trying to, to come to an agreement, political agreement. So everything was on the right track. 
So there are things that um, we try to develop and we, tr and we try very hard at that time to, to come to an agreement. And, uh, and we thought that the economic, the positive economic uh, situation and the aid that the Palestinians are receiving from what we call the donor countries, that are almost uh, America, Canada, and the European, Japan, and other rich countries, uh, gave, them to, uh, gave that, that time to them. This will also uh, incentivate them to, to, to come to an agreement. But uh, there, there is a big problem of, uh, of leadership uh, in the Palestinian society. And uh, I'm sure that the Palestinians are suffering now, now because now they are, they are not working in Israel. And from us, and you know, in, Israel, in my country, there is a law of, uh, of uh, uh, salary, of minimum salary. It is almost, I think, uh, 400 to 500 dollars. So every Palestinian that was coming, uh, working in Israel, at least he has his 500 dollars. Today, I think the per capita is no more than uh, 100 to 120 dollars. So this is a situation, difficult situation for them too. The question is, uh, why settlements in the West Bank? And the implication was that it's Palestinian territory. Yeah. The, in 1948, the, the territories that uh, now are the territories of Samaria, Judea, and Judea, those uh, 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 the, were supposed to be part of the Palestinian state. As I said, in 1948, the UN decided, or 1947, uh, uh, decided to create two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Arabs refused. The Palestinian state was not created. Instead of the Palestinian state, the Jordanians conquered this area, and they were responsible of Samaria and Judea till 1967. When they, uh, in 1967, we find after the, the Six Day War, when the, we, we, we were fearing almost the destruction of Israel, we find, uh, to the majority of our to the surprise of the majority of the Israelis, controlling all these territories. These territories were never, were never a part of Israel, but they were controlled by Israel. Um, this is also the, the, the land, uh, uh, the land where the Bible uh, mentioned uh, uh, where our forefathers were living. That is, uh, if you open the Bible and you see the cities, uh, that uh, that uh, are marked in the in the Bible. Those are the the, the, the cities in the, in this part of the of the territory. So we have a, a strong attachment to this area, an historical attachment to this area. Uh, nevertheless, in uh, 2000, uh, we were ready to give up uh, all these territories, almost everything, 97 percent, including the majority of the settlements swapping some territories. That is, uh, there are settlements there. Uh, the settlements, uh, uh, we were ready to withdraw some of them, at least one third of them. And uh, the others were keeping this 3% of territories that uh, 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 was part of what uh, the Clinton plan uh, prepared to Israel, uh, uh, including the swapping of territories of Israel instead of that. So uh, this, is the, this was the plan. The, uh, Israel accepted, the Palestinians refused. What is the Israeli position with respect to the building of fences, including yeah. how extensive do you imagine them to yeah. be? Well, uh, a gentleman asked me a few minutes ago about uh, uh, Palestinians coming to Israel. So I said that the Palestinians, suicide bombers, can even walk to Israel. So we, we were trying uh, uh, in the last uh, few months, and uh, this is our military, we were pushing to have some kind of obstacles, something that can stop those suicide bombers. At least we know that we cannot, this is not 100% uh, uh, measure that can be uh, succeed, but at least, you know, to interfere, to stop them, to try to, to make it uh, difficult. And uh, so the government decided to, to, to have a fence uh, almost uh, 100 kilometers fence. This is not all the area of Samaria, Judea, or the West Bank, but uh, this, this, this is a fence that will be, particularly in those areas where the Palestinians and Israelis are living very close one to the other, and where crossing from one side to the other is very easy. Uh, but this uh, fence, for sure, has a lot of political implications. And there is a big discussion in my country between uh, what are the implications. Is this really a security element? For sure it is. If at least we can stop uh, uh, five people to be killed, it's already an achievement. But uh, 
if it's uh, the signal about the border between uh, Israelis and Palestinians. And uh, so this is a big question, and there's a big debate here going on in Israel. And for sure, uh, uh, I'm sure that in the next elections, this may be one of the main important issues, if not the main issue of the next election. Is uh, uh, Yasser Arafat a, a plausible negotiating partner? Yeah, I think that he, he is not anymore a, a partner. This is what we realized in the last 20 months. We, it's very difficult to come to a table of negotiations and say that uh, he's, uh, I'm a man of peace and suddenly see that he's using, again, terrors uh, against us. So what we are uh, trying to see if, uh, and to find, and it's very important, it's essential, we say is to have a new partner. We cannot, uh, as a democratic society, to impose on the Palestinians a new leaders. They have to come up from their society. They have to choose their own. So we are pushing now in a very subtle way and trying and asking the help of the US and European countries and the UN to try to see if they can, uh, I would say, uh, reinforce the, these uh, calls inside the Palestinian society asking for, for a new leadership, asking for uh, less corrupt uh, leadership, asking for people that can uh, lead them to a better future and not to the future that uh, uh, Mr. Arafat has led them in the, last, uh, in the last years. So what we are trying now to aim is to, uh, to have as, uh, a, some kind of government, this is the creation of uh, some kind of government for the, by the Palestinians with a chief executive, something that we can call a, a, a prime minister, with ministers, one in charge of security, one in charge of uh, education, one in charge of mass media, one in charge of economics, trying to, uh, and I'm raising the main problems of the Palestinian society. And uh, having Arafat uh, aside, not in charge, not responsible. Uh, someone uh, put it in, in a funny way, saying, that, well, he will be the, the uh, Queen, Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth of the Palestinians and, and their responsibilities. So, this is, this is uh, in fact, is not being responsible for, for, and I'm sorry to, for the comparison. <laughs> what does Israel expect from the United States? Yes. Well, uh, with the United States, it's, uh, we have a very long and very strong relation uh, since the creation of Israel. Uh, the United States recognized Israel as the third country uh, to recognize Israel. And, uh, and uh, since then, uh, we have uh, developed uh, uh, a very strong relationship. This relationship is based on principle and values, democratic societies, uh, open societies, and um, we have been a stronghold for the U.S. in this area. We have promoted stability, and I think that the relationship uh, between the Isra Israel and the U.S. has been a relation of friendship. Uh, let me give you maybe the example that I, quote, I mentioned a few minutes ago about uh, Iraq uh, in 1991, Iraq uh, decided to attack Israel in order to provoke us, in order to transform this war, the Gulf War, as you may remember, in a regional war. And uh, there were 39 uh, scouts that uh, we received uh, in our heads in Tel Aviv and the other areas. And Israel didn't react. And so we, we took into consideration the interests of the U.S. And we, at that time, we, we said we received these cuts and we, we decided uh, not to react in order to keep the interests of the, of the U.S. safe and, and, uh, and keep the stability and not transform this war of, from Iraq against uh, Kuwait and afterwards, afterwards again the coalition in a war against Israel. So uh, the, the relations are very uh, are excellent. Uh, we have a, a bipartisan support in Congress. I think that also President Bush and former presidents that uh, manifested each one his way, his friendship to, to the state of Israel. And, and we, we are very, uh, we are happy on that. The question is, are, are there characteristics or perhaps interests of the uh, leaders of Egypt and uh, Jordan which account for them having uh, uh, better relations with Israel than other Arab states, and do you look for those same characteristics perhaps in other Arab countries? Well, uh, as I said, um, in the first uh, four, almost 40 years of uh, the creation of State of Israel, there were uh, Arab leaders that thought that by violence or by war they can destroy the State of Israel. 
think that when the Arab leaders uh, recognized that they cannot destroy the, the state of Israel, so they, were, uh, they chose other means. And there were uh, uh, good leaders, good leaders for, for the country, good leaders for the relations with Israel, as President Sadat in Egypt and uh, the late uh, uh, King Hussein in Jordan, that uh, came to the conclusion that the best thing is to live in peace with Israel. Uh, and to develop a, a, a better future for the citizens of that economies, to try to integrate the economies. It, uh, it doesn't work as, as still, but we have some promises, uh, starters uh, in Jordan and also in Egypt. Uh, what is, was very important that there was a, a trust created between both countries, and so we don't have war. And this is, I think, this is the fun, as a bottom line, is the, the main result. Uh, when uh, Sadat came, uh, Begin said, okay, uh, I trust you, and I signed uh, the peace, and I gave back the territories, and uh, let's live in peace. And well, since 77, we are living in peace with the Egypt. And uh, the same goes with, with Jordan uh, in 94. Uh, Arafat has the occasion to make peace with four Israeli prime ministers, uh, uh, Rabin, uh, Perez, uh, Netanyahu, uh, and Barak, and now with Sharon, and uh, he felt, he felt question is water, and the specific question is, uh, are your supplies secure? Yeah. Uh, water is an important uh, issue in, the, in Israel, but also in the area, because uh, we are a very tiny country, so if there is a drought, uh, all the countries in the area are suffering from that. And uh, due to that, we understand and we are very confident that the solution to the problems of water, not only in Israel, but also in the region, has to be regional solutions. And maybe I will surprise you to tell you that uh, till today, the only committee that we uh, have with the Palestinians, that is an active committee that's taking decisions, that are discussing issues, is the Water Committee. Almost every month we have meetings. You know, it seems out of the blue and uh, dis uh, disconnected with reality. So, and, uh, but this is important because if we can come to an agreement on these serious issues of water, and, and the Jordanians are also a part of this meeting. So we can come to other, other issues too. So this is the reason why uh, I, I think that uh, not only on water, but in other issues, uh, uh, Israelis and Palestinians and Israeli and Arabs uh, can come to a, to, to a positive conclusion to the demands and, and uh, in the near future if, if there is a change on the leadership uh, of, of the Arab countries, and particularly on the Palestinians. How long will it take to democratize the Palestinians? <laughs> well, I, um, I, I, th I, th I think that it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question because uh, I, I will say that uh, the fact that the Palestinians and Israelis are living almost together, one to the other, uh, most of the Palestinians, when you are approaching them on a personal basis, are really uh, considering in a very positive way you know, these uh, discussions Israel has had on, on their democracy. We are a very vocal democracy, as you may know. Um, uh, 29 ministers, uh, almost 16 parties, uh, part of the coalition. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a big, a big democracy. And the Palestinians admire that. And uh, they, they've told us, uh, told me in, in different occasions. So um, on your question particularly, I would say that uh, it's, it's, we need a process, so we need to have this chief executive, we need to have this government. They may, they may be invited to Washington, you know, the way that Karzai was um, uh, invited uh, in Afghanistan uh, before uh, he was elected. Come here to, to receive the legitimation, to prepare the ground, and uh, after, afterwards the Israelis, the Americans, Europeans, and all that, those parties involved in trying to recreate a more healthy Palestinian uh, uh, leadership. So this may be the, the right time to start with elections. Can the United States deliver Israel to the Palestinians? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I would say that uh, there is a, there's a long standing understanding between Israel and the U.S about uh, two democracies and, you know, their, their ways and means. Uh, we, we are always very careful what uh, our American friends are telling us. But uh, I think that the Americans also understand uh, how, we, how, how we react. Uh, Israel is in a very difficult neighborhood. I, we are almost the only democracy in the area. As I 
try to explain uh, there are not only the Palestinian issue, it's not the only threat that we are facing, Hezbollah in the north, Iran and Iraq uh, having their uh, mass destruction weapons uh, developments, uh, terrorism from all the world. So we, we, we are in a very difficult uh, region and uh, so we have to be very cautious and the Americans understand that. Uh, we will never ask American soldiers to come to defend Israel. We, we, we have learned how to defend ourselves, and they understand it. Other Arab countries, as you mentioned, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, trying to promote uh, now uh, some kind of understanding, some kind of vision to the area, to the region. And this is important because, uh, you know, we, we Israelis uh, like very much to hear it. Arab countries proposing peace uh, are proposing ways to, to reach peace uh, uh, between our uh, between countries in the region. Um, the reasons why they are doing that is because uh, those countries that there are no democracies and uh, are feeling that uh, under the ground uh, something is trembling and uh, and um, the leadership uh, would like to have. The, these negotiations between Israelis going on in order to explain to the population that, uh, well, there is a process, so now it's the moment to give the, them the, the opportunity to, to, to come to an agreement. And, uh, but uh, so there is an, a domestic problem in each one of the countries that you mentioned. But uh, despite that, it's important that they, are prom that they are presenting a vision. It's, a, it's a, like my foreign minister said the other day, it's a, it's a light. The light is very important. The problem now is the tunnel. We have to build a tunnel, how to get to this light. <laughs> and uh, so how, what is the process to, to get to the light, to the, to the peace understanding between Arabs and, uh, and Israelis? Um, so in this, this, is the, this is our main task uh, in these days. The proposal is to resettle Palestinians from the West Bank to Gaza and Jordan. Um, how do you feel about that? On Gaza. Just, not just, just the West Bank. Just right, but I thought they'd go from, Ga from the West Bank to both Gaza and Jordan. You know, this is, a, this is a something that has to, become, uh, has to be initiated by the Palestinians, and uh, we will not impose this type of solutions. Uh, we are well aware, you know, the big wars. Uh, uh, now we are also uh, watching TV and reading in the papers. Uh, the others, I am peace, totally Israeli Palestinians. You have Indian and Pakistanis uh, fighting against uh, one to the other of Kashmir. So in this area, in '48, there were more than half a million uh, of uh, people coming from refugees coming from one side to the other, and, uh, and things uh, came to a, to, a, to a positive conclusion at that time. Uh, I don't think that the Israelis will, will propose that. Uh, we, we will like to come to a solution in which the Palestinians and the Israelis uh, are integrated in one economy. Uh, and uh, we started with that in the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, for sure, there is a big difference uh, between the Israeli economy and the Palestinians. But uh, the way that uh, Germany and France uh, did it uh, uh, in the last years in Europe uh, with this economic union, after they, for almost uh, years and years, they fought one to the other. So we, we, we think that economic solutions can be founded, and, uh, and those two economies uh, can be complementary one to the other. And uh, in a climate, you know, it's very difficult to understand when there is this terror and fighting and confrontation, but uh, when it disappears, so all the possibilities are there, and I think there is a big willingness from both sides, both peoples, to cooperate one to each other. What are you going to do about the camps on the West Bank, the back of Valley, and uh, will uh, the Jordanians accept a Palestinian state on their borders? Yeah. Three questions. Well, about the camps, uh, uh, in 1948, uh, when the, the war ended, the uh, UN decided to create an organization, and his name is UNRWA, uh, that uh, was, was dealing with refugees. It was created for, for, a, only for a period of time. And, in order to, to try to solve this, uh, the problem of the Palestinian refugees. Israelis, at that time, as I said, uh, absorbed uh, more than a million and a half refugees coming from Europe, Arab countries. The Arab countries kept this refugee problem as an open country. Only Jordan integrated them and transformed uh, most of them into Jordanians, uh, Transjordanians at that time, uh, citizens. The other Arab countries, Syria, Lebanon, 
Iraq and away, Egypt and Gaza at that time, Keep the, kept the, the refugees as a problem in order to, to show while well, there is an Israeli Arab problem. And, uh, and UNRWA also work and give, uh, you know, we have I think, the third generation of, uh, of refugees, uh, something that it's, uh, it's difficult to, to understand, but uh, this was a political tool for the, from the Arabs. Um, so we, we would like this, I think this is a problem that can be solved. It's a question of mainly of, uh, of money and, uh, and goodwill, political will. And I think that uh, there are solutions for, for these people. Second about uh, Becca. But this is an, another different problem. This is a, a terrorist center in, in, in eastern Lebanon, uh, where the, there, is a, um, a, there are a lot of groups, uh, particularly the uh, Iranians are there. They have uh, more than 150 um, um, revolutionary guards, uh, instructors. Uh, there are Hezbollah and there are other organizations. So, um, and Syria is supporting them, and Syria is closing their eyes when the Iranian planes are arriving with, uh, to Damascus and uh, transporting rockets and other weapons to this area. And, uh, and we know for many years uh, that instability was created in the, in the area through the camps that, uh, that we saw in Lebanon. The government of Lebanon is doing nothing. It's important to do something positive, and unfortunately, on this issue. So this is, remains a, a big, a big problem, um, and a problem that uh, only is, is affecting not only Israel but also the Americans. Uh, uh, as you may remember, also Hezbollah was one of the organizations that attacked the, the American Marines in Beirut in, in Taros in, uh, in, the, in the late uh, uh, 70s. Um, now, uh, about uh, the Jordanians. Uh, well, Jordanian, Jordan is a country, is a kingdom where almost 60 to 70 percent uh, of the citizens are uh, Palestinian, uh, are original from the Palestinians. So this is, uh, and the other 30 uh, are what they call Bedouins. And, uh, so, but this is the only country that uh, integrates uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, cities, fellows and, uh, and they are part of the, now of the society, very dynamic, particularly in the economics. Um, Jordan is a very important country. Geographically, it's, uh, you know, it's close to in, uh, with Ira in Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel now, so it's, uh, it's, it's a country that uh, is not a rich country at all, depending on his neighbors, and uh, he deserves and likes to have very stable, stable uh, neighbors. Uh, to the moment, I would say that Israel is the most stable country to Jordan, and, uh, and the most uh, uh, is the country that they have a lot. Of, we have a lot of trust, uh, mutual trust. And we are cooperating a lot. We are not speaking, but we are cooperating a lot in order to improve and increase the cooperation between the two countries. And in this uh, aim, uh, Jordanians as a whole, Bedouins, Palestinians together, are, are working on the, with the same aim. Would you comment about uh, potential replacements for Mr. Arafat? Yes, well, I, I, I will say I, there are a lot of names that I am hearing, uh, Abu Allah and Abu Mazen and uh, uh, Rajup, Jibril Rajup, and uh, so it's, uh, I, I really, this is a, is a process that has to come, uh, and the Khlan, this is a process that has to come through the Palestinian society itself. I, I, we Israelis, we would like no, not to intervene. We, we, know, we know all of them that I mentioned, I know them personally. And I'll, uh, I, I think that uh, all four or five uh, can be uh, good leaders for the Palestinians, and. Uh, they have a very deep understanding of the Israeli society. Most of them speak even Hebrew, and you know it was uh, very funny in, uh, having our discussions with our Americans uh, aside, asking English, 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 because we were speaking Hebrew <laughs> with the Palestinians. So, uh, so, um, um, so those are the, the uh, I would say, uh, some of the, of the leaders and gentlemen in the Palestinian society that uh, I feel that we can trust. But this is uh, not a, an issue that we, we Israelis have to decide. It has to come uh, from, uh, from bottom up to the, from the Palestinian society itself. Why are the Europeans disappointed with Israel's recent actions? Yeah. Well, uh, there, there are um, a lot of uh, different reasons, uh, I would say. The, the main reason is um, uh, that I will um, 
I will mention today, I think, is, uh, is the, the fact that the, in most of the Arab uh, the European countries, there are um, Arab minorities that are uh, uh, pushing and uh, trying to, to change the opinions of the governments. And uh, particularly, we saw the reactions of them before elections in France and others in Belgium. Um, so this is an, this is an, is a, is an element, an uh, important element, I would say, in, in real politics. Another element, uh, I would say, it's, uh, it's, it's the way that the, the common history affects uh, some of our Europeans vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Jews during years. And uh, I think that some of them, uh, uh, um, that they really don't know our history, uh, they really don't know what happened to uh, Jewish uh, people during the Second World War II. Second World War. So these uh, events uh, that affected a generation disappear now, and uh, the next generation of, uh, of uh, Europeans and some of the leaders, and uh, some of the leaders, particularly on the right and on the left, you, you find always uh, in these demonstrations against Israel the extreme right and the extreme left. And um, so having these two elements, uh, one that is very uh, vocal, and the second, the leaderships uh, that uh, due to political internal considerations remain very quiet, this affected the public opinion uh, positions in, uh, in Europe. If you continue to be faced with suicide bombings, what are your options? The questioner would like to know exactly what you would do. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a very difficult and tough situation. It's, uh, I think the, what we spoke before about wall fences, uh, this is part, of the, it's part of, the, of the question. But we understand that uh, violence is not the answer. We, the, we, we, will, we will like and we are trying to promote a political dialogue with Palestinians and to show the, the, them, particularly the leaders, that there is a, a future. And I'm, uh, I'm quite optimistic. I know in the Palestinians, uh, during three years, uh, as you said, I, I spend more time with the Palestinians than with my wife and children. And, um, and I, I, I'm a strong believer that we can develop an, a, a different approach. I was very, very disappointed uh, uh, what, uh, for what had happened in, in, uh, in Camp David, after Camp David. And I, I'm also confident in, in the Israeli public opinion. I, I know that now the Israeli public opinion uh, it's not supporting this leader or other leaders. The Israeli public opinion is defending himself. But the moment they will see a change on the Palestinian authority and on the Palestinian, I would say particularly in the leadership, so they will move also. And in my country, when the public opinion moves, the politicians move also. You know, it's democracy. So this is, this, those are the rules of the game. But there will be no move, it will be violence. It will be violence, unfortunately, for the Palestinians, for the Israelis, violence will ever continue. But as I said, and let me finish with an optimistic tone, I hope that uh, things will be better.